So we've now seen lots of ways to show that functions are discontinuous, but we haven't seen very many ways to show that they're continuous. So we need to build up a bit of theory and take advantage of all the functions that we already knew were continuous from last year. So we're going to start by building up an algebra of limits and a sandwich theorem for real valued function limits. Now, what do we already have? We've already got, from last year, an algebra of limits for sequence convergence. And we've got, this year, we <coughs> boosted that up a bit to give an algebra of limits for vector convergence. And so we've got those available for free. But function limits are a different kind of limit. There's a connection, but with, a, with sequence limits, you've got as n tends to infinity. With function limits, you've got as the vector approaches another vector, and it can come in along all sorts of different directions and so on. But the connection between them is that the definition we're working with is in terms of every sequence which tends to this point, the sequence of function values should tend to this other value. And because of that connection, we can boost up the results that we already had for sequences to give us results for function limits. So when you write some expression down involving a limit, you should always know which kind of limit you're talking about. So if you write down limit as n tends to infinity, you should know that you're talking about a limit of a sequence of points. If you write the limit as x vector x tends to vector a, you should know you're talking about some sort of function limit. Different kind of limits related by the definitions in terms of sequences. Now, of course, first I've got to remind you about standard way of making new functions from old. And these are the so-called pointwise operations. If you've got two functions taking values in the same vector space, then you can add them pointwise by just adding the values together. You can multiply the values they take by scalar and so on. So here we're talking about real valued functions to make life easier because we know that checking the real valued setting is the key for us. Um, and so you can add functions pointwise and you can multiply them by constants. And here's the usual thing. If you want to add the function f to the function g, it means add all the values together. Of course, the value is at the same point x. So if you take the point x and you want to know what the function f plus g does, then it's f of x plus g of x. Save for the pointwise product, which we can do because they're real values here. Um, you wouldn't do this if you're taking values in r to the l. You could do the first one if you're taking values in the same vector space, but you shouldn't be multiplying two vectors together. So the second one is probably safest if you're working with real values. The third one works even if you're taking values in a vector space. Um, you can multiply the function by a constant lambda. So lambda f of x is, well, lambda times f of x. You take the value f of x and multiply it by the constant lambda. Uh, but to make it clear that this is a new function called lambda f, I put that function in brackets. And again, you can form a new function mod f. We're taking real values here. So you can form a new function mod f defined by mod f of x is modulus of f of x, and so on. So that's how you do the usual pointwise new functions from old thing. They've got the same domain. Um, remember, there's a different notion of putting two functions together, which is a composite function, you can do f composed with g, sort of f of g of x, if your domain and codomains match up. That's not what we're talking about here. Here we're talking about multiplying the values together. And finally, if you want to divide by g of x, then you better not have g of x equals 0. But as long as g of x isn't 0, you can do the quotient f over g, define it at x by f of x over g of x. Um, so you can only define this function f over g at points of d where g is non-zero. And we'll be pointing that out at the crucial points later. So with that notion of pointwise operations to get new functions from old, we could ask about the algebra of real-valued function limits. And you get exactly what you expect. If f of x tends to L1 and g of x tends to L2, 
then f of x plus g of x tends to L1 plus L2. If f of x tends to L1 and g of x tends to L2, then f of x, g of x tends to L1, L2. The limit of the modulus is the modulus of the limit. That's the limit of modulus of f of x is the modulus of L1. And the limit of a constant times f is a constant times the limit. Again, no problem. These are all the things you'd expect, but I want to prove that so you can see how we can boost up results from the algebra of limits for sequences to prove results for the algebra of limits for function limits. So I'll prove this one for you properly, or at least some of it, not all of it, because it's all the same. All the, all the proofs of this are the same. So I'll just prove one of these bits, and you can imitate the same proof and get proof of all the rest. So we'll prove the first one. Oh, yes. So, oh, of course, and the quotient thing works as well, um, except you have to be a bit careful because you're supposed, you have to approach the point through other places in D in your domain. So the safest thing is to make sure you're not dividing by zero anywhere, um, except, of course, we don't care. Because we're talking, uh, talking about function limit as you approach A, the values at A, even if they're defined, don't matter. So we don't care if g of a is zero because it's irrelevant to the calculation here if we're just looking at the limit. You only want to know what does g do on the rest of the set and you want to make sure you're not dividing by zero as you approach the point. Okay, so let's uh, have a look at this. So we'll use the algebra of limits for sequences to prove this result for function limits. Again, if you're not clear about the difference between these kind of limits, then you need to think about it because it's very important to know which kind of limits you're working with. So what do we know? We know that f of x tends to L1 as x tends to A in D and g of x tends to L2 so consider the function f plus g so f plus g of x is equal to f of x plus g of x. And we've got to prove that the limit as x tends to a of f plus g of x which is the same as f of x plus g of x, is equal to L1 plus L2. Uh, the other parts are all the same. So that's an exercise. And now we're going to use the definition from this module, which is that we have to check every possible sequence in D that converges to A. Now, notice that A was not an isolated point of D, so I could get away with saying let. <coughs> I'm trying to prove something happens for every sequence tending to A, so I say let Xn 
be a sequence in D with xn tends to A as n tends to infinity. Now that's a sequence limit. Then, since f of xn, since f of x tends to L1 as x tends to A, we have f of xn f of xn tends to L1 as n tends to infinity. Note the two different kinds of limit. The first one, f of x tends to L1, that's a function limit, as x tends to a. The second one is a sequence limit. As n tends to infinity, the sequence of values, f of xn, tends to L1. Um, similarly, g of xn tends to L2 as n tends to infinity. So, by the algebra of limits of sequences, f of xn plus g of xn tends to L1 plus L2 as n tends to infinity. But since this is true for every sequence of this form, this shows that the limit as x tends to a of f of x plus g of x. is equal to L1 plus L2. Because we've shown that they tend to the right thing for every possible sequence tending to the point. So we've used our definition, plugged it in, used our old algebra of limits to prove the new algebra of limits for function limits. And I've already told you to do the rest yourself in that exercise. And we better stop there today because we've run over. Sorry about that.